Chapter Twenty Four of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. Chapter Twenty Four. About this time, Mr. Irving's London publisher, Mr. Murray, proposed to him the editorship of a new monthly magazine which he was intending to publish, and offered him a salary of five thousand dollars, besides a liberal compensation for any original articles of his own which he might be inclined to furnish mr murray also offered him one hundred guineas per article for any contributions to the quarterly review both of these offers were declined the former for the reason that he was unwilling to enter into any permanent engagements that would prevent him from returning to his native country which he was now longing to do and he declined the offer for the review articles owing to its hostility to the United States. About the 1st of November, Irving returned to Seville, where he shortly received a letter from his brother Peter at London, notifying him that someone in the United States was preparing an abridgment of his history of Columbus, and urging him to forestall this undertaking, and himself to provide immediately such an abridgment. Realizing the importance of this matter, he at once entered upon the work, and completed it in nineteen days, making a book of about four hundred pages. A number of hands were employed in copying the manuscript, and in a little more than a month from the day of commencing it, the work was on its way to America. He also forwarded a manuscript copy to his London publisher as a gratuity, who at once disposed of an entire edition of ten thousand copies, as one of the volumes of his family library. At New York the abridgment was disposed of to the purchaser of the first unabridged edition, and the right of printing a second edition of the latter, together with the abridgment, for five years, was sold to the same purchaser for six thousand dollars. Shortly after Irving's return to Seville, he received news of the death of Mr. Hall, who had been his fellow lodger for the six months past, and to whom he had become very much attached, and whose death he very sincerely mourned. "'It is a long while,' he writes to a friend, "'since I have lived in such domestic intimacy with any one but my brother. I could not have thought that a mere stranger, in so short a space of time, could have taken such a hold upon my feelings.' In reviewing, at its close, the year 1828, Mr. Irving speaks of it as a year of much literary application, and one of the most tranquil of his life. The success of his Columbus had been greater than anticipated, and had given him hopes of executing something of greater permanence than what he could reasonably expect for his works of mere imagination, and he looked toward the future with a cheerful heart, especially as he was now anticipating a speedy return to his native country. At the commencement of the year 1829, Mr. Irving was honored with a diploma as corresponding member of the Royal Academy of History at Madrid. During the winter and beyond, he seems to be again resting upon his laurels. There is not much moving of his pen, and no important undertaking is on hand. His correspondence indicates a longing for home, while yet he feels that the time to return has not yet arrived. He anticipates that a season of dissipation will inevitably follow his return, when he would not for some time be able to resume any important literary labor. Hence he is anxious to have some such enterprise in progress, so far that it can be carried forward in spite of any slight diversions or interruptions. Nor does he seem in readiness to leave Spain, a country which, together with its people, had for Irving a special attraction— Thus, in a letter to his friend, Prince Dolgoruki, he writes, I feel so attached to Spain that the thoughts of soon leaving it are extremely painful to me, and it will be gratifying to me to take a farewell view of some of its finest scenes, in company with one who knows how to appreciate this noble country and noble people. As may be inferred from the above extract, the two gentlemen had planned an excursion together to some of the more interesting cities of Spain, and about the middle of April 1829 the prince arrives at Seville from Madrid. On May Day the two travellers set off together on horseback for Granada, when, after a pleasant journey of five days, they arrive safely. 
after a twelve-day sojourn at a hotel they change their quarters for the governor's vacant apartments in the palace of the alhambra here as may well be supposed mr irving was in his element and was accommodated in accordance with his heart's best wishes it appears that they had obtained permission from the governor to occupy one or two of his own apartments and you may easily imagine he writes to his brother peter how delightfully we are lodged with the whole pile at our command to ramble over its halls and courts at all hours of day and night without control the part we inhabit is intended for the governor's quarters but he prefers at present residing down in the city we have an excellent old dame and her good-humoured bright-eyed niece who have charge of the alhambra who arrange our rooms meals etc with the assistance of a tall servant boy and thus we live quietly snugly and without any restraint elevated above the world and its troubles in a few days prince dolgoruki sets off to pursue his travels through andalusia and irving seems to have been left in sole possession of the palace he writes of feeling at first somewhat lonely and doleful for a time the weather was wet and cold and there was a cheerless aspect around those marble and lofty halls but pleasant weather and balmy sunshine came at length and restored all the charms of the alhambra soon also he is again at work among his books and manuscripts and becomes busy and cheerful i breakfast says he in the saloons of the ambassadors or among the flowers and fountains of the court of the lions and when i am not occupied with my pen i lounge with my book about these oriental apartments or stroll about the courts and gardens and arcades by day or night with no one to interrupt me it absolutely appears to me like a dream or as if i am spellbound in some fairy palace on the tenth of june irving finished his work entitled legends of the conquest of spain a production which was not published till several years afterward about the same time he received notice of his appointment as secretary of legation to london a piece of intelligence which seems to have given him but little pleasure as such an office would probably interfere very seriously with all his literary plans i confess he writes to a friend i feel extremely reluctant to give up my quiet and independent mode of life and i am excessively perplexed there are many private reasons that urge me on independent of the wishes of my friends while my antipathy to the bustle there and the busyness of the world incline me to hold back i only regret that i have not been left entirely alone to dream away life in my own way the appointment as may well be guessed was brought about through the agency of certain friends at home and on his part was neither sought for nor desired he was now entirely absorbed in literary plans and enterprises and in this line of effort he had settled down as to his life work and deprecated every interference with it for any extraneous purpose after deciding to accept the appointment he determined however that should he find the office irksome in any respect or detrimental to his literary plans he would at once throw it up being happily independent of it both as to circumstances and as to ambition sentiments entirely similar he expresses to mr everett alleging that the office was unsought whether by himself or his relatives that he had no inclination for office and was doubtful that he had any turn for it that his reclusive literary life had well nigh unfitted him for worldly business and bustle and he had no political ambition to be gratified he seems to have accepted the office more to please his friends than himself determined however that as the place was unsought and undesired by him so in accepting it he would commit himself to no set of men or measures but as heretofore keep himself as clear as possible of all party politics and continue to devote all his spare time to general literature end of chapter twenty four recording by maria casper chapter twenty five of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano 
Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams Chapter 25 After nearly three months of delightful residence at the Alhambra, Mr. Irving, about the last of July, commenced his journey toward England. His departure was to him like leaving a safe and tranquil port to embark upon a stormy and treacherous sea. Time with him had passed there, as in a kind of oriental dream. Quote, Never shall I meet on earth with an abode so much to my taste, or so suited to my habits and pursuits. The sole fault was that the softness of the climate, the silence and serenity of the place, the odor of flowers and the murmur of fountains, had a soothing and voluptuous effect that at times almost incapacitated me for work, and made me feel like the knight of industry, when so pleasingly enthralled in the castle of indolence. End quote. He was accompanied by a young Englishman, an educated gentleman who was on his way homeward. They travelled as far as to Valencia in a sort of horse cart, in which they could sit or recline at pleasure and where the roads were pleasant they walked extensively their progress toward valencia averaged about thirty miles a day the route lying through murcia orihuela and alicante he describes the country embracing these localities as highly romantic and delightful level as a table and a vast garden land covered for many leagues groves of oranges citrons pomegranates palms and dates bordered in the distance by towering mountains picturesque in outline and sublime from their very nakedness and sterility a part of their route was infested by robbers but the travellers escaped disturbance or harm and came in eleven or twelve days to valencia after a day or two the travellers took the diligence for barcelona here mr irving was detained several days by the sickness of mr sneed his fellow-traveller after which they set out for france mr s being still feeble yet such was his anxiety to reach home that they travelled nine days and nights incessantly until they reached paris all this was too much for the unfortunate young gentleman and he died shortly after reaching home it seemed a specially melancholy death as he was a young man of fortune and brilliant prospects and was about to be married quote, the scenes says irving i had with his afflicted parents are too painful to be repeated End quote. after remaining a fortnight at paris with his brother peter he proceeded to london from which he had been absent between five and six years he soon became established in his secretaryship and the following note to his brother Peter at Paris seems to indicate that he had begun to be considerably reconciled to his new position. Quote, I feel disposed, now that I am in diplomatic life, to give it some little trial. The labors are not great, especially in my present situation. It introduces me to scenes and affairs of high interest, and in that way, perhaps, prepares me for higher intellectual labors the very kind and flattering manner also in which i am treated in all circles is highly gratifying End quote. his lodgings were immediately opposite the legation the office of which was very comfortable and entirely at his command his duties were comparatively light while his social position and relations were of course all he could desire meanwhile the avails of his works published in london and new york had already secured to him a competence, so that he was no longer under any necessity of writing for bread. Under these pleasant circumstances he pens the following sunny note to Peter. Quote, My idea is not to drudge at literary labor, but to use it as an agreeable employment. We have now sufficient funds to ensure us a decent support, should we choose to retire upon them. We may, therefore, indulge in the passing pleasures of life, and mingle amusement with our labors. End quote. Mr. Irving was at this early period contemplating as his great work and crowning labor a life of Washington, an enterprise, however, which was destined to be deferred for many years. 
Two other literary honors were now awaiting him. The first, one of the two medals of the Royal Society of Literature, adjudged annually to the authors of literary works of eminent merit, or of important literary discoveries. The other honor was that of the degree of LLD, conferred on him by the University of Oxford. On this occasion, advancing in the presence of the great audience to receive his diploma, he was assailed with prolonged and laughable greetings from the students, shouting, Diedrich Knickerbocker, Ichabod Crane, Rip Van Winkle, Geoffrey Crayon, Columbus, Sketchbook, Bracebridge Hall, etc. He was quite overcome by such a volley of salutations, and was laboring meanwhile with suppressed laughter at the unexpected and vociferous applause. The modesty of Irving is said to have prevented him ever making use of his honorable title, and from so honorable a source. He was accustomed to view it as a learned dignity, urged upon him against his own judgment. End of chapter 25 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 26 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Chapter 26 Having been a year in his secretaryship, we find Mr. Irving putting to press his Voyages of the Companions of Columbus. Footnote this work of Irving seems to have been designed as a sort of appendage to his Columbus. It comprised an account of voyages undertaken by several distinguished navigators soon after the first discovery by Columbus. End of footnote. At the same time he was employed upon his Alhambra tales, several of which he had already finished. He begins, however, to feel sensibly the trammels connected with his official position and complains that he has no time for anything quote, i feel my situation he says a terrible sacrifice of pleasure profit and literary reputation without furnishing any recompense End quote. it is not strange that with such feelings as these irving should be inclined to seize the first opportunity to retire from his office Accordingly, in September 1831, he was released, after having served two years at the legation. The remainder of the year he seems to have devoted to visiting his Birmingham relations, and excursions to various other interesting places. Among these last was Newstead Abbey, once the possession and seat of Lord Byron. Footnote. The former seat of Lord Byron, who by stress of circumstances, was obliged to part with it, to his very great regret. It was purchased by a devoted friend of the bard, who expended large sums to put the old abbey in complete repair. Irving writes in 1831, about the time he visited it, that, quote, It is a most ancient, curious, and beautiful pile, of great extent and intricacy, and, when restored, will be one of the finest specimens of the mingled conventual and baronial buildings in england everything relative to lord byron is preserved with the most scrupulous care the bedroom he occupied with all its furniture as it stood many of his books his boxing gloves etc End of footnote. meanwhile he was busy in finishing and correcting some manuscripts complaining however of restlessness and uncertainty of mind and feelings tending to interference with imaginative writing the alhambra which had been for some time on hand was put to press in the ensuing spring and as usual at new york and london the london publisher paid about five thousand dollars for the manuscript and at new york he received three thousand dollars for the privilege of printing five thousand five hundred copies also for his voyages above mentioned, he received at London $2,600, and at New York $1,500 for 3,000 copies. Mr. Irving now made diligent preparation for returning to the United States, and, 
embarking at Havre, April 11, he arrived at New York after a passage of forty days. As might be supposed, he met a most cordial reception, and rejoiced greatly as, after an absence of seventeen years, he touched again the soil of his native city. In a letter to his brother Peter, whom he left behind him in Europe, he writes, quote, I have been absolutely overwhelmed with the welcomes and felicitations of my friends. It seems as if all the old standers of the city had called on me, and I am continually in the midst of old associates who, thank God, have borne the wear and tear of seventeen years surprisingly, and are all in good health, good looks, and good circumstances. I have been in a tumult of enjoyment ever since my arrival, and pleased with everything and everybody, and as happy as a mortal being can be. End quote. A public dinner was accorded to him in New York, attended by the elite of the city, which was presided over by Chancellor Kent, and was a most deeply interesting occasion. Public dinners were also proffered him at Philadelphia and Baltimore, both of which, however, he declined. After his arrival home, Mr. Irving devoted several weeks to various visits and excursions. He takes an early opportunity to visit Washington, to pay his respects to the government he had, for a brief period, been serving abroad. Mr. Moline, with whom he was associated at London, was now Secretary of the Treasury, with whom and his family Irving spent some delightful days, and was received most cordially by all the family, great and small. He also called on the President, Jackson, with whom he seems to have been, quote, much pleased as well as amused, end quote and who hinted to his visitor that he might want him for another place under the government. But Irving gave him to understand clearly that he desired no further public responsibilities, and he seems at this time to be entirely settled in his mind to an exclusively literary life. In the course of the summer we track him up the Hudson, at West Point, the Highlands, Terrytown, Saratoga, Trenton Falls, and the White Mountains. Everywhere he is full of animation and delight, and tells his brother Peter, over the sea, of the pleasant times he is having. Quote, In fact, I return to all the simple enjoyments of old times, with the renovated feelings of a schoolboy, and have had more hearty, homebred delights of the kind since my return to the United States than I ever had in the same space of time in the whole course of my life. End quote. The autumn he devoted to a tour to the far west, in company with commissioners appointed by government to treat with deputations of different tribes of Indians. This tour took him into the territory lying west of Arkansas, and appropriated to the Indian tribes. The journey westward from St. Louis was mainly on horseback, and beyond the frontiers they encamped out at night, while their subsistence was by the wild game of the forest and prairie. He describes his tour as very rough, but interesting and pleasing, the travelers leading, as they went, a hunter's life, camping by streams and sleeping on skins or blankets in the open air, enjoying high health and exuberant spirits. His return was by way of steamboat down the Arkansas and Mississippi to New Orleans, and thence by stage through the States to Washington, where he passed the winter very pleasantly with his friends, the Malines. Here he became intensely interested in the great nullification debates, then going forward. Quote, I became, he says, so deeply interested in the debates of Congress that I almost lived at the Capitol. The grand debate in the Senate occupied my mind for three weeks, as did ever a dramatic representation. I heard about every speech, good and bad, and did not lose a word of any of the best. End quote. He afterward adds, quote, I think my close attendance on the legislative halls has given me an acquaintance with the nature and operation of our institutions, and the character and concerns of the various parts of the Union, that I could not have learned from books for years. End quote. Leaving Washington for New York, we find him detained three weeks at Baltimore, enthralled in the abundant hospitality of the city. Quote, Going the rounds of dinners, he says, until as jaded as I was in London. Time and mind are cut up with me like chopped hay, and I am good for nothing, and shall be good for nothing for some time to come, 
so much am I harassed by the claims of society. End quote. Thus, amid his various travels, excursions, and visitings, more than a year seems to have passed after his arrival from abroad before Mr. Irving could seriously set himself to work with his pen. In the meantime, he again incurred some serious pecuniary reverse, which, however, disturbed him but slightly, as he had an abundance remaining. During the second winter after his return from abroad, he was again diligently at his literary labors and progressing therein satisfactorily. He was domiciled in the family of his brother Ebenezer, and managed to keep himself clear of evening engagements and dinner parties, and thus was enabled to improve the winter to the utmost. We subjoin here a single extract from the Companions of Columbus. It relates to the discovery of the Pacific Ocean by Vasco Nunez. Quote, Why, said the young cacique, should you quarrel for such a trifle, if this gold is indeed so precious in your eyes, that for it alone you abandon your homes, invade the peaceful lands of others, and expose yourselves to such sufferings and perils? I will tell you of a region where you may gratify your wishes to the utmost. Behold, these lofty mountains, beyond these lies a mighty sea, which may be discerned from their summit. It is navigated by people who have vessels almost as large as yours, and furnished like them with sails and oars. All the streams which flow down from the southern side of these mountains into that sea abound in gold, and the kings who reign upon its borders eat and drink out of golden vessels. Gold, in fact, is as plentiful and common among these people of the south as iron is among Spaniards. The day had scarce dawned when Vasco Nunez and his followers set forth from the Indian village and began to climb the height. It was a severe and rugged toil for one so way-worn, but they were filled with new ardor at the idea of the triumphant scene that was so soon to repay them for all hardships. About ten o'clock in the morning they emerged from the thick forests through which they had hitherto struggled, and arrived at a lofty and airy region of the mountain. The bold summit alone remained to be ascended, and their guides pointed to a moderate eminence from which the southern sea was visible. Upon this Vasco Nunez commanded his followers to halt, and that no man should stir from his place. Then, with a palpitating heart, he ascended alone the bare mountain top. On reaching the summit, the long-desired prospect burst upon his view. It was as if a new world were unfolded to him, separated from all hitherto known by this mighty barrier of mountains. Below him extended a vast chaos of rock and forest, and green savannas, and wandering streams, while at a distance the waters of the promised ocean glittered in the morning sun. At this glorious prospect, Vasco Nunez sank upon his knees, and poured out thanks to God for being the first European to whom it was given to make that great discovery. He then called his people to ascend. Behold, my friends, said he, that glorious sight which we have so much desired. Let us give thanks to God that he has granted us this great honor and advantage. End, quote. End of chapter 26 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 27 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams Chapter 27 The Alhambra met a most cordial reception from every quarter, and received much praise at home and abroad. Edward Everett, in the North American Review, considered the work as being equal in literary value to any of the author's other works, except the sketch-book, while Mr. Prescott, in his Ferdinand and Isabella, pronounces it the beautiful Spanish sketch-book. The author's sketch of his journey from Seville to Granada is highly instructive as well as interesting, presenting to us as it does so picturesque a view of Spanish scenery, mode of travelling, etc., Many, he writes, are apt to picture Spain to their imaginations as a soft southern region, decked out with all the luxurious charms of voluptuous Italy. 
on the contrary though there are exceptions in some of the maritime provinces yet for the greater part it is a stern melancholy country with rugged mountains and long naked sweeping plains destitute of trees and invariably silent and lonesome partaking of the savage and solitary character of africa what adds to this silence and loneliness is the absence of singing birds a natural consequence of the want of groves and hedges the vulture and the eagle are seen wheeling about the mountain cliffs and soaring over the plains and groups of shy bustards stalk about the heaths but the myriads of smaller birds which animate the whole face of other countries are met with in but few provinces of spain and in them chiefly among the orchards and gardens which surround the habitations of man in the exterior provinces the traveller occasionally traverses great tracts cultivated with grain as far as the eye can reach waving at times with verdure at other times naked and sunburnt but he looks round in vain for the hand that has tilled the soil at length he perceives some village perched on a steep hill or rugged crag with mouldering battlements and ruined watch-tower a stronghold in old times against civil war or moorish inroad for the custom among the peasantry of congregating together for mutual protection is still kept up in most parts of spain in consequence of the maraudings of roving freebooters but a great part of spain is deficient in the garniture of groves and forests and the softer charms of ornamental cultivation yet its scenery has something of a high and lofty character to compensate that want it partakes something of the attributes of its people and i think that i better understand the proud hardy frugal and abstemious spaniard his manly defiance of hardships and contempt of effeminate indulgence since i have seen the country he inhabits there is something too in the stern and simple features of the spanish landscape that impresses on the soul a feeling of sublimity the immense plains of the castiles and la mancha extending as far as the eye can reach derive an interest from their very nakedness and immensity and have something of the solemn grandeur of the ocean in ranging over these boundless wastes the eye catches sight here and there of a straggling herd of cattle attended by a lonely herdsman motionless as a statue with his long slender pike tapering up like a lance into the air or beholds a long train of mules slowly moving along the waste like a train of camels in a desert or a single herdsman armed with blunderbuss and stiletto prowling over the plain thus the country the habits the very looks of the people have something of the arabian character the general insecurity of the country is evinced in the universal use of weapons the herdsman in the field the shepherd in the plain has his musket and his knife the wealthy villager rarely ventures to the market town without his trabuco and perhaps a servant on foot with a blunderbuss on his shoulder and the most petty journey is undertaken with the preparations of a warlike enterprise the dangers of the road produce also a mode of travelling resembling on a diminutive scale the caravans of the east the arrieros or carriers congregate in troops and set off in large and well-armed trains on appointed days while individual travellers swell their number and contribute to their strength in this primitive way is the commerce of the country carried on the muleteer is the general medium of traffic and the legitimate wanderer of the land traversing the peninsula from the pyrenees and the asturias to the alpucharas the serrania de rondo and even to the gates of gibraltar he lives frugally and hardily his alforjas or saddle-bags of coarse cloth hold his scanty stock of provisions a leathern bottle hanging at his saddle-bow contains wine and water for a supply across barren mountains and thirsty plains a mule-cloth spread upon the ground is his bed at night and his pack-saddle is his pillow his low but clear-limbed and sinewy form betokens strength his complexion is dark and sunburnt his eye resolute but quiet in its expression except when kindled by sudden emotion his demeanour is frank manly and courteous 
and he never passes you without a grave salutation. God guard you, God be with you, cavalier. As these men often have their whole fortune at stake upon the burden of their mules, they have their weapons at hand, slung to their saddles, and ready to be snatched down for desperate defence. But their united numbers render them secure against petty bands of marauders, and the solitary bandolero, robber, armed to the teeth and mounted on his Andalusian steed, hovers about them like a pirate about a merchant convoy, without daring to make an assault. It has a most picturesque effect also to meet a train of muleteers in some mountain pass. First you hear the bells of the leading mules, breaking with their simple melody the stillness of the airy height, or perhaps the voice of the muleteer admonishing some tardy or wandering animal, or chanting at the full stretch of his lungs some traditionary ballad. At length you see the mules slowly winding along the craggy defile, sometimes descending precipitous cliffs, so as to present themselves in full relief against the sky, sometimes toiling up the deep arid chasms below you. As they approach you, you descry their gay decorations, of worsted tufts, tassels, and saddle-cloths, while, as they pass by, the ever-ready trabuco, slung behind their packs and saddles, gives a hint of the insecurity of the road. The ancient kingdom of Granada, into which we are about to penetrate, is one of the most mountainous regions of Spain. Vast sierras, or chains of mountains, destitute of shrub or tree, and mottled with variegated marbles and granites, elevate their sunburnt summits against a deep blue sky, yet in their rugged bosoms lie engulfed the most verdant and fertile valleys, where the desert and the garden strive for mastery, and the very rock, as it were, is compelled to yield the fig, the orange, and the citron, and to blossom with the myrtle and the rose. In the wild passes of these mountains, the sight of walled towns and villages, built like eagles' nests among the cliffs, and surrounded by Moorish battlements, or of ruined watch-towers perched on lofty peaks, carry the mind back to the chivalrous days of Christian and Moslem warfare, and to the romantic struggle for the conquest of Granada. In traversing these lofty sierras, the traveller is often obliged to alight, and lead his horse up and down the steep and jagged ascents and descents, resembling the broken steps of a staircase. Sometimes the road winds along dizzy precipices, without parapet to guard him from the gulfs below, and then will plunge down steep and dark and dangerous declivities. Sometimes it struggles through rugged barrancos or ravines, worn by water torrents, the obscure paths of the contrabandista, smugglers, while ever and anon the ominous cross, the memento of robbery and murder, erected on a mound of stones at some lonely part of the road, admonishes the traveller that he is among the haunts of the banditti, perhaps at that very moment under the eye of some lurking bandolero. Sometimes, in winding through the narrow valleys, he is startled by a hoarse bellowing, and beholds above him, on some green fold of the mountainside, a herd of fierce Andalusian bulls, destined for the combat of the arena. There is something awful in the contemplation of these terrific animals, clothed with tremendous strength, and ranging their native pastures in untamed wilderness, strangers almost to the face of man. They know no one but the solitary herdsman who attends upon them, and even he at times dares not venture to approach them. The low bellowings of these bulls, and their menacing aspect as they look down from their rocky height, give additional wildness to the savage scenery around. On reaching Granada, and entering the palace of the Alhambra, and walking meditatively amid its ancient halls, he feels himself to be treading upon haunted ground, while romantic associations cluster thickly around him. From earliest boyhood, when on the banks of the Hudson I first pored over the pages of an old Spanish story about the wars of Granada, that city has ever been a subject of my waking dreams and often have I trod in fancy the romantic halls of the Alhambra. Behold, for once, a daydream realized. 
yet i can scarcely credit my senses or believe that i do inhabit the palace of boabdil and look down from its balconies upon chivalric granada as i loiter through the oriental chambers and hear the murmuring of fountains and the song of the nightingales as i inhale the odor of the rose and feel the influence of the balmy climate i am almost tempted to fancy myself in the paradise of mahomet and that the plump little dolores is one of the bright-eyed houris destined to administer to the happiness of true believers the author's selection of his chamber at the palace is curious as well as characteristic on taking up my abode in the alhambra one end of a suite of empty chambers of modern architecture intended for the residence of the governor was fitted up for my reception it was in the front of the palace looking forth upon the esplanade the farther end communicated with a cluster of little chambers partly moorish partly modern inhabited by fia antonia and her family i was dissatisfied with being lodged in a modern and frontier apartment of the palace and longed to ensconce myself in the very heart of the building as i was rambling one day about the moorish halls i found in a remote gallery a door which i had not before noticed communicating apparently with an extensive apartment locked up from the public here then was a mystery here was the haunted wing of the castle i procured the key however without difficulty the door opened to a vast range of vacant chambers of european architecture though built over a moorish arcade along the little garden of lindaraxa there were two lofty rooms the ceilings of which were of deep panel work of cedar richly and skilfully carved with fruits and flowers intermingled with grotesque masks or faces but broken in many places the walls had evidently in ancient times been hung with damask but now were naked and scrawled over with the insignificant names of aspiring travellers the windows which were dismantled and open to wind and weather looked into the garden of lindaraxa and the orange and citron trees flung their branches into the chambers there was something in the very decay that enhanced the interest of the scene speaking as it did of that mutability which is the irrevocable lot of man and all his works i determined at once to take up my abode in this apartment my determination excited great surprise in the family who could not imagine any rational inducement for the choice of so solitary remote and forlorn an apartment the good fia antonia considered it highly dangerous the neighbourhood she said was infested by vagrants the caverns of the adjacent hills swarmed with gipsies the palace was ruinous and easy to be entered in many parts and the rumour of a stranger quartered alone in one of the ruined apartments out of the hearing of the rest of the inhabitants might tempt unwelcome visitors in the night especially as foreigners are always supposed to be well stocked with money dolores represented the frightful loneliness of the place nothing but bats and owls flitting about then there were a fox and a wild cat that kept about the vaults and roamed about at night i was not to be diverted from my humour so calling in the assistance of a carpenter the doors and windows were soon placed in a state of tolerable security with all these precautions i must confess the first night i passed in these quarters was inexpressibly dreary i was escorted by the whole family to my chamber and there taking leave of me and retiring along the waste antechamber and echoing galleries reminded me of those hobgoblin stories where the hero is left to accomplish the adventure of a haunted house end of chapter twenty seven recording by maria casper chapter twenty eight of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams, Chapter 28 At the beginning of the year 1835, Mr. Irving commenced the plan of publishing a series of volumes under the general title of Miscellanies, comprising various manuscripts which he already had on hand, and others yet to be prepared. The first of these was his Tour on the Prairies, 
an account of the expedition already noticed to the indian country this work was published in the following spring in this country and england edward everett noticing this book in the north american review remarks that he was hardly able to say to what class of compositions it properly belonged it can scarcely he says be called a book of travels for there is too much painting of manners and scenery and too little statistics it is not a novel for there is no story and it is not a romance for it is all true it is a sort of sentimental journey a romantic excursion in which nearly all the elements of several different kinds of writing are beautifully and gaily blended into a production almost sui generis the reviewer adds in his conclusion the american father who can afford it and does not buy a copy of mr irving's book does not deserve that his sons should prefer his fireside to the bar-room the pure and chaste pleasures of a cultivated taste to the gross indulgences of sense he does not deserve that his daughters should prefer to pass their leisure hours in maidenly seclusion and the improvement of their minds rather than to flaunt on the sidewalks by day and pursue by night an eternal round of tasteless dissipation writing of the prairie indians and their horses mr irving says the habits of the arabs seem to have come with the steed the introduction of the horse on the boundless prairies of the far west changed the whole mode of living of their indian inhabitants it gave them that facility of rapid motion and of sudden and distant change of place so dear to the roving propensities of man instead of lurking in the depths of gloomy forests and patiently threading the mazes of a tangled wilderness on foot like his brethren of the north the indian of the west is a rover of the plain he leads a brighter and more sunshiny life almost always on horseback on vast flowery prairies and under cloudless skies as they journey one of their attendants a half-breed indian beati by name pursues catches and subdues one of the wild horses of the prairie as he was returning to the camp he came upon a gang of six horses which immediately made for the river he pursued them across that stream left his rifle on the river bank and putting his horse to full speed soon came up with the fugitives he attempted to noose one of them but the lariat hitched on one of his ears and he shook it off the horses dashed up a hill he followed hard at their heels when of a sudden he saw their tails whisking in the air and they plunging down a precipice it was too late to stop he shut his eyes held in his breath and went over with them neck or nothing the descent was between twenty and thirty feet but they all came down safe upon a sandy bottom he now succeeded in throwing his noose round a fine young horse as he galloped alongside of him the two horses passed each side of a sapling and the end of the lariat was jerked out of his hand he regained it but an intervening tree obliged him again to let it go having once more caught it and coming to more open country he was enabled to play the young horse with the line until he gradually checked and subdued him so as to lead him to the place where he had left his rifle he had another formidable difficulty in getting him across the river where both horses stuck for a time in the mire and beate was nearly unseated from his saddle by the force of the current and the struggles of his captive after much toil and trouble however he got across the stream and brought his prize safe into the camp beati just as we were about to march strapped a light pack upon his back by way of giving him his first lesson in servitude the native pride and independence of this animal took fire at the indignity he reared and plunged and kicked and tried in every way to get rid of the degrading burden the indian was too potent for him at every paroxysm he renewed the discipline of the halter until the poor animal driven to despair threw himself prostrate on the ground and lay motionless as if acknowledging himself vanquished a stage hero representing the despair of a captive prince could not have played his part more dramatically there was absolutely a moral grandeur in it the imperturbable beati folded his arms and stood for a time looking down in silence upon his captive until seeing him perfectly subdued he nodded his head slowly 
screwed his mouth into a sardonic smile of triumph, and with a jerk of the halter ordered him to rise. He obeyed, and from that time forward offered no resistance. During that day he bore his pack patiently, and was led by the halter. But in two days he followed voluntarily, at large, among the supernumerary horses of the troop. I could not but look with compassion upon this fine young animal, whose whole course of existence had been so suddenly reversed. From being a denizen of these vast pastures, ranging at will from plain to plain and mead to mead, cropping of every herb and flower, and drinking of every stream, he was suddenly reduced to perpetual and painful servitude, to pass his life under the harness and the curb, amid, perhaps, the din and dust and drudgery of cities. The transition in his lot was such as sometimes takes place in human affairs, and in the fortunes of towering individuals, one day a prince of the prairies, the next day a pack-horse. Mr. Irving and one of his companions had made an unsuccessful attempt at buffalo hunting, but were not entirely discouraged. We determined not to seek the camp until we had made one more effort. Casting our eyes about the surrounding waste, we descried a herd of buffalo about two miles distant, scattered apart, and quietly grazing near a small strip of trees and bushes. It required but little stretch of fancy to picture them, so many cattle grazing on the edge of a common, and that the grove might shelter some lowly farmhouse. We now formed our plan to circumvent the herd, and by getting on the other side of them, to hunt them in the direction where we knew our camp to be situated. Otherwise the pursuit might take us to such a distance as to render it impossible for us to find our way back before nightfall. Taking a wide circuit, therefore, we moved slowly and cautiously, pausing occasionally when we saw any of the herd desist from grazing. The wind fortunately set from them, otherwise they might have scented us and have taken the alarm. In this way we succeeded in getting round the herd without disturbing it. It consisted of about forty head, bulls, cows, and calves. Separating to some distance from each other, we now approached slowly in a parallel line, hoping by degrees to steal near without exciting attention. They began, however, to move off quietly, stopping at every step to graze, when suddenly a bull, that unobserved by us had been taking his siesta under a clump of trees to our left, roused himself from his lair, and hastened to join his companions. We were still at a considerable distance, but the game had now taken the alarm. We quickened our pace, they broke into a gallop, and now commenced a full chase. As the ground was level, they shouldered along with great speed, following each other in a line, two or three bulls bringing up the rear, the last of whom, from his enormous size and venerable frontlet and beard of sunburnt hair, looked like the patriarch of the herd, and as if he might long have reigned the monarch of the prairie. There is a mixture of the awful and the comic in the look of these huge animals, as they bear their great bulk forward, with an up-and-down motion of unwieldy head and shoulders, their tail cocked up like the cue of pantaloon in a pantomime, the end whisking about in a fierce yet whimsical style, and their eyes glaring venomously with an expression of fright and fury. For some time I kept parallel with the line, without being able to force my horse within pistol-shot, so much had he been alarmed by the assault of the buffalo in the preceding chase. At length I succeeded, but was again balked by my pistol's missing fire. My companions, whose horses were less fleet and more wayworn, could not overtake the herd, and at length Mr. L., who was in the rear of the line and losing ground, leveled his double-barreled gun and fired a long raking shot. It struck a buffalo just above the loins, broke its backbone, and brought it to the ground. He stopped and alighted to dispatch his prey, when, borrowing his gun, which had yet one charge remaining in it, I put my horse to his speed, again overtook the herd, which was thundering along, pursued by the Count. With my present weapon there was no need of urging my horse to such close quarters. Galloping along parallel, therefore, I singled out a buffalo, 
and by a fortunate shot brought it down on the spot. The ball had struck a vital part. It would not move from the place where it fell, but lay there struggling in mortal agony, while the rest of the herd kept on their headlong career across the prairie. Dismounting, I now fettered my horse to prevent his straying, and advanced to contemplate my victim. I am nothing of a sportsman. I had been tempted to this unwonted exploit by the magnitude of the game and the excitement of an adventurous chase. Now that the excitement was over, I could not but look with commiseration upon the poor animal that lay struggling and bleeding at my feet. His very size and importance, which had before inspired me with eagerness, now increased my compunction. It seemed as if I had inflicted pain in proportion to the bulk of my victim, and as if there were a hundredfold greater waste of life than would have been in the destruction of an animal of an inferior size. Mr. Irving presents us with a sketch of the prairie dogs and one of their villages. The prairie dog is an animal of the coney kind and about the size of the rabbit. He is of a sprightly, mercurial nature, quick, sensitive, and somewhat petulant. He is very gregarious, living in large communities, sometimes of several acres in extent, where innumerable little heaps of earth show the entrance to the subterranean cells of the inhabitants, and the well-beaten tracks, like lanes and streets, show their mobility and restlessness. According to the accounts given of them, they would seem to be continually full of sport, business, and public affairs, whisking about hither and thither, as if on gossiping visits to each other's houses, or congregating in the cool of the evening, or after a shower, and gambling together in the open air. Sometimes, especially when the moon shines, they pass half the night in revelry, barking or yelping, with short, quick, yet weak tones like those of very young puppies. When in the height of their playfulness and clamor, however, should there be the least alarm, they all vanish into their cells in an instant, and the village remains blank and silent. In case they are hard-pressed by their pursuers, without any hope of escape, they will assume a pugnacious air, and a most whimsical look of impotent wrath and defiance. The prairie dogs are not permitted to remain sole and undisputable inhabitants of their own homes. Owls and rattlesnakes are said to take up their abodes with them but whether as invited guests or unwelcome intruders is a matter of controversy. The owls are of a peculiar kind, and would seem to partake of the character of the hawk, for they are taller and more erect on their legs, and more alert in their looks and rapid in their flight than ordinary owls, and they do not confine their excursions to the night, but sally forth in broad day. Some say that they only inhabit cells which the prairie dogs have deserted, and suffered to go to ruin, in consequence of the death in them of some relative, for they would make out this little animal to be endowed with keen sensibilities that will not permit it to remain in the dwelling when it has witnessed the death of a friend. Other fanciful speculators represent the owl as a kind of housekeeper to the prairie dog, and from having a note very similar insinuate that it acts in a manner as family preceptor and teaches the young litter how to bark. As to the rattlesnake, nothing satisfactory has been ascertained of the part he plays in this most interesting household, though he is considered as little better than a sycophant and sharper, that winds himself into the concerns of the honest, credulous little dog, and takes him in most sadly. Certain it is, if he acts as a toad-eater, he also occasionally solaces himself with more than the usual perquisites of his order, as he is now and then detected with one of the younger members of the family in his maw. The second volume of the Miscellanies, comprising Abbotsford and Newstead Abbey, immediately followed the first volume. These are briefer compositions, and are delightful sketches, drawn from the author's personal recollections of those two literary shrines. These two volumes of miscellanies were received with great favor on both sides of the Atlantic, and the author was encouraged to proceed with the series. The third volume appeared in the following autumn with the title of Legends of the Conquest of Spain. End of chapter 28. 
Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter Twenty Nine of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter Twenty Nine. In October eighteen thirty six, Mr. Irving put to press his volume Astoria a work which he had been induced to undertake at the solicitation of the millionaire john jacob astor footnote mr astor was a native of germany born in seventeen sixty three and when twenty years old emigrated to this country and engaged in the fur trade establishing himself in new york he displayed great skill in business and prospered to such an extent that he was soon able to export furs abroad in his own ships bringing back foreign produce for the new york market while engaged extensively in the fur trade he also made large purchases of real estate in new york which advanced greatly on his hands at his death he was worth twenty million dollars in his lifetime and at his death Mr. Astor made many liberal donations for benevolent objects, but his principal beneficence was the establishment of the library which bears his name. This library is already one of the largest in the country, and its accommodations and volumes have been largely increased since his death by the liberality of his son, W. B. Astor, Esquire. The library buildings are sufficiently ample to contain two hundred thousand volumes and will soon be full end of footnote this book relates to mr astor's settlement of a colony which he had established at the mouth of the columbia river and the plan of the great capitalist was to secure to himself by this volume the reputation of having originated the enterprise and founded the colony which was quote, likely to have such important results in the history of commerce and colonization End quote. irving from the press of other literary engagements was reluctant to undertake the work but having enlisted the cooperation of his nephew mr pierre m irving who was to arrange the principal materials to be afterward finished and embellished by his uncle the work was duly prosecuted and executed to the entire satisfaction of mr astor as well as to the gratification and warm approval of the public of astoria the north american review remarks that quote, the whole work bears the impress of mr irving's taste a great variety of somewhat discordant materials is brought into a consistent whole in which the parts have a due reference to each other in some sketches of life and traits of humor come fresh from the pen of geoffrey crayon End quote. Quote, i have says sidney smith read astoria with great pleasure it is a book to put in your library as an entertaining well-written very well-written account of savage life on a most extensive scale End quote. Quote, the most finished narrative says the london spectator that ever was written whether with regard to plan or execution the arrangement has all the art of fiction yet without any sacrifice of truth or exactness the composition we are inclined to rate is the chef d'oeuvre of washington irving End quote. the climate of the country west of the rocky mountains is described as follows quote, a remarkable fact characteristic of the country west of the rocky mountains is the mildness and equability of the climate that great mountain barrier seems to divide the continent into different climates even in the same degrees of latitude the rigorous winters and sultry summers and all the capricious irregularities of temperature prevalent on the atlantic side of the mountains are but little felt on their western declivities the countries between them and the pacific 
are blessed with milder and steadier temperature, resembling the climates of parallel latitudes in Europe. In the plains and valleys, but little snow falls throughout the winter, and usually melts while falling. It rarely lies on the ground more than two days at a time, except on the summits of the mountains. The winters are rainy rather than cold. The rains for five months, from the middle of October to the middle of March, are almost incessant, and often accompanied by tremendous thunder and lightning. The winds prevalent at this season are from the south and southeast, which usually bring rain. Those I from the north to the southwest are the harbingers of fair weather and a clear sky. The residue of the year, from the middle of March to the middle of October, an interval of seven months, is serene and delightful. There is scarcely any rain throughout this time, yet the face of the country is kept fresh and verdant by nightly dews and occasionally by humid fogs in the mornings. These are not considered prejudicial to health, since both the natives and the whites sleep in the open air with perfect impunity, while this equable and bland temperature prevails throughout the lower country. The peaks and ridges of the vast mountains, by which it is dominated, are covered with perpetual snow. This renders them discernible at a great distance, shining at times like bright summer clouds, at other times assuming the most aerial tints and always forming brilliant and striking features in the vast landscape. The mild temperature prevalent throughout the country is attributed by some to the succession of winds from the Pacific Ocean, extending from latitude 20 degrees to at least 50 degrees north. These temper the heat of summer, so that in the shade no one is incommoded by perspiration. They also soften the rigors of winter, and produce such a moderation in the climate that the inhabitants can wear the same dress throughout the year. End quote. A party traversing the wilderness found themselves reduced to such desperate circumstances as are here depicted. Quote, in this way they proceeded for seventeen miles over a level plain of sand until, seeing a few antelopes in the distance, they encamped on the margin of a small stream. All now that were capable of exertion turned out to hunt for a meal. Their efforts were fruitless, and after dark they returned to their camp, famished almost to desperation. As they were preparing for the third time to lie down to sleep without a mouthful to eat, the clerk, one of the Canadians, gaunt and wild with hunger, approached Mr. Stewart with his gun in his hand. It was all in vain, he said, to attempt to proceed any further without food. They had a barren plain before them, three or four days' journey in extent, and which nothing was to be procured. They must all perish before they could get to the end of it. It was better, therefore, that one should die to save the rest. He proposed, therefore, that they should cast lots, adding, as an inducement for Mr. Stewart to assent to the proposition, that he, as leader of the party, should be exempted. Mr. Stewart shuddered at the horrible proposition, and endeavored to reason with the man, but his words were unavailing. At length, snatching up his rifle, he threatened to shoot him on the spot if he persisted. The famished wretch, dropped on his knees, begged pardon in most abject terms, and promised never again to offend him with such a suggestion. Quiet being restored to the forlorn encampment, each one sought repose. Mr. Stewart, however, was so exhausted by the agitation of the past scene, acting upon his emaciated frame, that he could scarcely crawl to his miserable couch, where, notwithstanding his fatigues, he passed a sleepless night, revolving upon their dreary situation and the desperate prospect before them. Before daylight the next morning, they were up and on their way. They had nothing to detain them, no breakfast to prepare, and to linger was to perish. They proceeded, however, but slowly, for all were faint and weak. Here and there they passed the skulls and bones of buffaloes, which showed that these animals must have been hunted here during the past season. The sight of these bones served only to mock their misery. 
after travelling about nine miles along the plain they ascended a range of hills and had scarcely gone two miles further when to their great joy they discovered an old run-down buffalo bull the laggard probably of some herd that had been hunted and harassed through the mountains they now all stretched themselves out to encompass and make sure of the solitary animal for their lives depended upon their success after considerable trouble and infinite anxiety they at length succeeded in killing him he was instantly flayed and cut up and so ravenous was their hunger that they devoured some of the flesh raw the residue they carried to a brook near by where they encamped lit a fire and began to cook mr stewart was fearful that in their famished state they would eat to excess and injure themselves he caused a soup to be made of some of the meat and that each should take a quantity of it as a prelude to his supper this may have had a beneficial effect for though they sat up the greater part of the night cooking and cramming no one suffered any inconvenience the next morning the feasting was resumed and about midday feeling somewhat recruited and refreshed they set out on their journey with renovated spirits shaping their course toward a mountain the summit of which they saw towering in the east and near to which they expected to find the headwaters of the missouri End quote. the next work brought out by mr irving was his adventures of captain bonneville u s a in the rocky mountains of the far west this work was digested from the journal of captain bonneville which irving purchased of him and which with illustrations from various other sources he shaped into this deeply interesting book quote, it is says chancellor kent full of exciting incident and by reason of mr irving's fine taste and attractive style possesses the power and the charms of romance End quote. We have a description of the trapper of the far west as he flourished forty years ago. Quote, Accustomed to live in tents or to bivouac in the open air, he despises the comforts and is impatient of the confinement of the log house. If his meal is not ready in season, he takes his rifle, hies to the forest or prairie, shoots his own game, lights his fire, and cooks his repast. With his horse and his rifle, he is independent of the world, and spurns at all restraints. There is, perhaps, no class of men on the face of the earth who lead a life of more continued exertion, peril, and excitement, and who are more enamored of their occupation than the free trappers of the West. No toil, no danger, no privation can turn the trapper from his pursuit. His passionate excitement at times resembles a mania. In vain, may the most vigilant and cruel savages beset his path in vain may rocks and precipices and wintry torrents oppose his progress let but a single track of a beaver meet his eye and he forgets all danger and defies all difficulties at times he may be seen with his traps on his shoulder buffeting his way across rapid streams amid floating blocks of ice at other times he is to be found with his traps swung on his back, clambering the most rugged mountains, scaling or descending the most frightful precipices, searching by routes inaccessible to the horse, and never before trodden by white man, for springs and lakes unknown to his comrades, and where he may meet with his favorite game. Such is the mountaineer, the hardy trapper of the West, and such, as we have slightly sketched it, is the wild Robin Hood kind of life with all its strange and motley populace now existing in full vigor among the rocky mountains the american trapper stands by himself and is peerless for the service of the wilderness drop him in the midst of a prairie or in the heart of the mountains and he is never at a loss he notices every landmark can retrace his route through the most monotonous plains or the most perplexed labyrinths of the mountains no danger nor difficulty can appall him, and he scorns to complain under any privation. In fact, no one can cope with him as a stark tramper of the wilderness. End quote. The trapper's Indian wife is also pictured for us. Quote, the free trapper, while a bachelor, 
has no greater pet than his horse, but the moment he takes a wife, he discovers that he has a still more fanciful and capricious animal on which to lavish his expenses. No sooner does an Indian belle experience this promotion than all her notions at once rise and expand to the dignity of her situation, and the purse of her lover, and his credit into the bargain, are tasked to the utmost to fit her out in becoming style. The wife of a free trapper to be equipped and arrayed, like any ordinary and undistinguished squaw, perish the groveling thought. In the first place, she must have a horse for her own riding, but no jaded, sorry, earth-spirited hack, such as is sometimes assigned by an Indian husband for the transportation of his squaw and her papooses. The wife of a free trapper must have the most beautiful animal she can lay her eyes on. And then, as to his decoration, headstall, breastbands, saddle, crupper, are lavishly embroidered with beads and hung with thimbles, hawks bells and bunches of ribbons from each side of the saddle hangs an esquimoot a sort of pocket in which she bestows the residue of her trinkets and knick-knacks which cannot be crowded on the decoration of her horse or herself over this she folds with great care a drapery of scarlet and bright-coloured calicoes and now considers the caparison of her steed complete as to her own person she is even still more extravagant her hair, esteemed beautiful in proportion to its length, is carefully plaited, and made to fall with seeming negligence over either breast. Her riding hat is stuck full of party-colored feathers. Her robe, fashioned somewhat after that of the whites, is of red, green, and sometimes of gray cloth, but always of the finest texture that can be procured. Her leggings and moccasins are of the most beautiful and expensive workmanship, and fitted neatly to the foot and ankle, which, with the Indian woman, are generally well formed and delicate. Then as to jewelry, in the way of finger rings, ear rings, necklaces, and other female glories, nothing within reach of the trapper's means is omitted that can tend to impress the beholder with an idea of the lady's high estate. To finish the whole, she selects from among her blankets one of glowing colors, and, throwing it over her shoulders with native grace, vaults into the saddle of her gay, prancing steed, and is ready to follow her mountaineer to the last gasp with love and loyalty. End quote. We have the curious use of a lasso in the hands of a Californian horseman. Quote, the lasso is also of great use in furnishing the public with a favorite, though barbarous sport the combat between a bear and a wild bull. For this purpose three or four horsemen sally forth to some wood frequented by bears, and, depositing the carcass of a bullock, hide themselves in the vicinity. The bears are soon attracted by the bait. As soon as one fit for their purpose makes his appearance, they run out, and dexterously noose him by either leg. After dragging him at full speed until he is fatigued, they secure him more effectually, and tying him on the carcass of the bullock, draw him in triumph to the scene of action. By this time he is exasperated to such frenzy, that they are sometimes obliged to throw cold water on him to moderate his fury. And dangerous would it be for horse and rider, were he, while in his paroxysm, to break his bonds. A wild bull of the fiercest kind, which has been caught and exasperated in the same manner, is now produced, and both animals are turned loose in the arena of a small amphitheater. The mortal fight begins instantly, and always at first, to the disadvantage of Bruin, fatigued as he is by his previous rough riding. Roused at length by the repeated goring of the bull, he seizes his muzzle with his sharp claws, and, clinging to this most sensitive part, causes him to bellow with rage and agony. In his heat and fury, the bull lolls out his tongue. This is easily clutched by the bear. With a desperate effort, he overturns his huge antagonist, and then dispatches him without difficulty. End of chapter 29 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida
Chapter Thirty of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. Chapter Thirty. It was in the midst of this season of busy authorship and publishing that Mr. Irving purchased his famous seat of Sunnyside. The place which he selected was a beautiful spot on the banks of the Hudson near Tarrytown, and comprised ten acres of ground, with a small Dutch cottage upon it built of stone. He thus describes the locality in his plan, quote, It is a beautiful spot, capable of being made a little paradise. There is a small stone Dutch cottage on it, built about a century since and inhabited by one of the van tassels i have had an architect up there and shall build upon the old mansion this summer my idea is to make a little nookery somewhat in the dutch style quaint but unpretending it will be of stone cost will not be much i do not intend to set up any establishment there but to put some simple furniture in it and keep it as a nest to which I can resort when in the mood. End quote. Soon afterward he writes again, quote, The workmen are busy upon my cottage, which I think will be a snug little Dutch nookery when finished. It will be of stone, so as to be cool in summer and warm in winter. The expense will be but moderate, as I have it built in the simplest manner, depending upon its quaintness rather than its costliness. End quote. Subsequently, on visiting the spot and inspecting the erection of the cottage, he tells his brother that he intends to write a legend or two about it, and its vicinity by way of making it pay for itself. Another letter to his brother Peter, who had now been abroad more than a quarter of a century, and who was contemplating a return home, presents at once a charming picture of the new cottage home, and of the warm fraternal affection glowing in the bosom of its proprietor. Quote, My cottage, he writes, is not yet finished, but I shall drive at it as soon as the opening of spring will permit, and I trust by the time of your arrival to have a delightful little nest for you on the banks of the Hudson. It will be fitted to defy both hot weather and cold. There is a lovely prospect from its windows, and a sweet green bank in front shaded by locust trees up which the summer breeze creep delightfully it is one of the most delicious banks in the world for reading and dozing and dreaming during the heats of summer and there are no mosquitoes in the neighborhood here you shall have a room to yourself that shall be a sanctum sanctorum you may have your meals in it if you please and be as much alone as you desire you shall also have a room prepared for you in town where you will be equally master of your time and yourself, and free from all intrusion, while at both places you will have those at hand who love and honor you, and who will be ready to do anything that may contribute to your comfort. End quote. Thus how pure and beautiful its true affection, and that, too, whether fraternal, filial, or parental, and how it is intensified and elevated when its objects are frail and feeble, as was this absent brother, and when dark fears come in, that they may not be long with us. But would our love not prompt us to do for such dear ones, and how eager we are to spend and be spent in their behalf? And then if the grave must close over them, how unutterable is the love that mingles itself with our great sorrow, impelling us almost to the wish that we might lie down with the loved and the lost, and sleep the long sleep with them. And yet Christianity reproves all this, and whispers to bereaved mourners, touching their departed treasures, quote, not lost, but gone before, end quote. The long absent brother whom Irving, as above, addressed so pleasantly and affectionately, and who on his return home was to receive so welcome a reception, reached New York in the following summer and the promised home at Sunnyside was ready for him in the early autumn. The closing months of the same year of 1836 found Washington, 
at fifty-three years of age, pleasantly and happily domiciled in his new and beautiful home on the banks of the Hudson. It is indeed a sunny scene to contemplate. The author's literary fame is widespread, acknowledged, and sure. Personally, he is great and universally respected and beloved. His health is perfect, and his spirits buoyant and sprightly, as in the days of his youth. His pecuniary circumstances are entirely comfortable, and increasingly prosperous. His pen has been, for the most part, greatly industrious, and was never more so than now. His audience has grown to millions, and he is only to write, and a hundred publishers are ready and earnest to print, and the world is eager to read. The very highest and selected society welcome him to his brilliant circles. Brothers and sisters are proud of him, and an interesting circle of nephews and nieces look up to him with admiration, love, and veneration. The roost is the significant epithet by which he has labelled his new and pleasant home. His beloved brother is with him, cheerful and happy, after his long exile and repeated misfortunes. Two trusty and competent servants, a man and woman, attend to all their domestic wants, and thus there opens to us at this sunny-side home about as attractive a picture of a bachelor life can be well conceived. One evening, the proprietor returns to the roost from the great city, and he sits down and pens a letter to an absent niece, and tells her, or rather writes that he cannot tell her, of his happiness in getting back again to his, quote, own dear bright little home, and leave behind him the hurry and worry and flurry of the city, End quote. He found all things going on well, his brother passing his time comfortably with better health and spirits, and still improving, enjoying the cosy comforts of the cottage, regular in his meals, cheerful, social, and busy. He adds that the goose and ducks are at peace, that a fancy pig has arrived at the cottage, which, being of the fair sex, and of peculiar beauty, he calls Fanny, that imp that is the cat, has taken to him lovingly, and that he expects to have great comfort in the cat, if it should be spared, etc. A few days later he writes to Ebenezer that, quote, all goes on well at the roost. Brother Peter is getting quite in good feather again, and begins to crow. You must contrive to come up soon, if it is only to see my new pig, which is a darling, End quote. So the roost and its keeper have the seeming of perfect correspondence and harmony. Quote, the place for the man and the man for the place end quote, was never more happily exemplified. Everything was complete, tasteful, homelike, comfortable and comely. The decorous and excellent arrangements had been created by the author's own genius and under his constant supervision, and, being now completely prepared and finished, he was as completely ready and qualified to enjoy everything appertaining to his fine establishment as is possible, to imagine, and the entire picture is, in a very high degree, pleasant and beautiful, with it so attractive a scene might continue through many, many years. But shadows must soon pass over even Sunnyside, yet we will not anticipate. End of chapter 30 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 31 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. Chapter 31. In 1838, Mr. Irving received the Tammany nomination for mayor of New York City which he very promptly declined. Immediately afterward, he was invited by President Van Buren to a seat in his cabinet as Secretary of the Navy, which he also declined. In his reply to this flattering invitation, he said that it was not so much the duties of the post that he feared, as the concerns of the Navy Department would be peculiarly interesting to him. 
but i shrink he adds from the harsh cares and turmoils of public and political life at washington and feel that i am too sensitive to endure the bitter personal hostility and the slanders and misrepresentations of the press which beset high station in this country this argues i confess a weakness of spirit and a want of true philosophy but i speak of myself as i am not as i ought to be i really believe it would take but a short career of public life at washington to render me mentally and physically a perfect wreck and to hurry me prematurely into old age amid the flattering honors thus proffered to mr irving scenes of mourning and affliction were intermingled in march of this year died his brother john four years his senior and who had for a score of years been first judge of the court of common pleas for the city and county of new york and who was eminent for his moral and social qualities in the following june came a much deeper affliction in the death of peter this was irving's most cherished and dearest brother they had both remained unmarried had been much together in their long residence abroad had encountered common misfortunes were similar in many of their tastes and were accustomed to confer together upon literary and other plans and enterprises indeed history presents few instances of a purer more elevated unselfish and refined fraternal relationship than what long existed between these two brothers all this is specially manifest in washington who seemed to identify his own interests with those of his brother with whom he was ever ready to share his last cent if it were necessary for the comfort of one he loved so much when peter after so long an absence was in feeble health contemplating a return from europe washington seemed to count it a mere pastime to cross the ocean for the purpose of conveying his invalid brother homeward and there are few moral pictures more beautiful than that of irving arranging and furnishing as we have before seen in the new cottage of sunnyside the room that was to be the special resting-place and home of his cherished brother and it is mournful to observe how few were the brief months which the invalid would be permitted to linger within that peaceful paradise yet such is this world and here we have no continuing city happy they who seek one to come a letter of irving to one of his sisters penned three months after his brother's decease partially reveals the depths of his affliction and the greatness of his bereavement every day he writes every hour i feel how completely peter and myself were intertwined together in the whole course of our existence indeed the very circumstance of our both having never been married bound us more closely together the rest of the family were married and had families of their own to engross and divide their sympathies and to weaken the fraternal tie but we stood in the original unimpaired relation to each other and in proportion as others were weaned away by circumstances we grew more and more together i was not conscious how much this was the case while he was living but now that he is gone i feel how all-important he was to me a dreary feeling of loneliness comes on me at times that i reason against in vain for though surrounded by affectionate relatives i feel that none can be what he was to me none can take so thorough an interest in my concerns to none can i so confidingly lay open my every thought and feeling and expose my every fault and foible certain of such perfect toleration and indulgence since our dear mother's death i have had no one who could so patiently and tenderly bear with all my weaknesses and infirmities and throw over every error the mantle of affection i have been trying of late to resume my pen and by engaging my mind in some intellectual task to keep it from brooding over these melancholy themes but i find it almost impossible my literary pursuits have so often been carried on by his side and under his eye i have been so accustomed to talk over every plan with him and as it were to think aloud when in his presence that i cannot open a book or take up a paper or recall a past vein of thought without having him instantly before me and finding myself completely overcome 
it was at this time and partly to soothe his sorrow for his lost brother that mr irving commenced a literary work which he counted upon as one of his most important efforts and from which he anticipated an ample pecuniary compensation the title of this new work was to be the conquest of mexico on this undertaking he had wrought diligently for some months when he visited new york for the purpose of consulting some works relating to his theme in the city library while thus engaged he was accosted by mr cogswell afterward connected with the astor library who inquired of irving concerning the subject upon which he was now employing himself as a result of this interview he learned from mr cogswell that prescott the historian was engaged upon the same theme with himself he was of course greatly surprised and doubtless much disappointed also as it was a subject in which he had long been deeply interested and on which he had already expended much labor however he promptly requested mr cogswell to notify mr prescott that he would abandon the subject to him and that he was happy of the opportunity of testifying his great esteem for the talents of the historian after reading over what he had written in a fit of vexation for having lost so magnificent a theme he destroyed the manuscript End of chapter thirty one recording by maria casper chapter thirty three of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano chapter thirty three in the spring of eighteen thirty nine mr irving entered into an engagement with the knickerbocker magazine by which he was to furnish monthly contributions for a compensation of two thousand dollars a year this arrangement continued during two years and the articles were afterward collected into a volume which he entitled wolfert's roost and which realized an extraordinary sale the book comprises stories sketches legends etc the leading article having the same title as the book itself and is a sort of history of his own sunny side comprised in three chronicles the work as a whole is in the author's accustomed style and while it had so remarkable a sale enjoyed an equally remarkable recommendation to the public for so abundant were the flattering notices of this little work that the publishers collected and published them by themselves in a pamphlet of twenty-four pages besides these notices the westminster review remarks quote, we envy those who will now read these tales and sketches of character for the first time washington irving is here as he always is equal to himself he has the finish of our best writers he has the equality and gentle humor of addison and goldsmith End quote. the london new monthly magazine noticing wolfert's roost pleasantly remarks quote, the warm heart and the fine brain went into partnership and wrote in good fellowship together in the days of the sketch-book and salmagundi and they found it answer and continue each the other's true yoke fellow to this hour geoffrey crayon gentleman is revived here End quote. chronicle one of wolfert's roost thus commenceth quote, about five-and-twenty miles from the ancient and renowned city of manhattan formerly called new amsterdam and vulgarly called new york on the eastern bank of that expansion of the hudson known among dutch mariners of yore as the tappan zee being in fact the great mediterranean sea of the new netherlands stands a little old-fashioned stone mansion all made up of gable ends and as full of angles and corners as an old cocked hat it is said in fact to have been modelled after the cocked hat of peter the headstrong as the escurial was modelled after the gridiron of the blessed st lawrence though but of small dimensions yet like many small people it is of mighty spirit and values itself greatly on its antiquity being one of the oldest edifices for its size in the whole country 
it claims to be an ancient seat of empire i may rather say an empire of itself and like all empires great and small has had its great historical epochs and speaking of this doughty and valorous little pile i shall call it by its usual appellation of the roost though that is a name given to it in modern days since it became the abode of the white man End quote. wolfert acker was one of the ancient denizens of the roost he is represented as a worthy but ill-starred personage whose aim through life had been to live in peace and quiet and who yet had managed to keep in a perpetual stew and was accustomed to share in every broil and rib wasting in all the country round at length he retired in high dudgeon to seek peace and quiet at this fastness of the wilderness called the roost but he was still doomed to disappointment Quote, wolfert's luck followed him into retirement he had shut himself up from the world but he had brought with him a wife and it soon passed into a proverb throughout the neighborhood that the cock of the roost was the most henpecked bird in the country his house too was reputed to be harassed by yankee witchcraft when the weather was quiet everywhere else the wind it was said would howl and whistle about the gables witches and warlocks would whirl about upon the weathercocks and scream down the chimneys nay it was even hinted that wolfert's wife was in league with the enemy and used to ride on broomstick to a witch's sabbath in sleepy hollow this however was all mere scandal founded perhaps on her occasionally flourishing a broomstick in the course of a curtain lecture or raising a storm within doors as termagant wives are apt to do and against which sorcery horseshoes are of no avail wolfert acker died and was buried but found no quiet even in the grave for if popular gossip be true his ghost has occasionally been seen walking by moonlight among the old gray moss-grown trees of his apple orchard one of the sketches presents us in language equally admirable and truthful the english and french character antithetically delineated Quote, no greater contrast is exhibited than that of the french and english the peace has deluged this gay city paris with english values of all ranks and conditions they throng every place of curiosity and amusement fill the public gardens the galleries the cafes saloons theatres always herding together never associating with the french the two nations are like two threads of different colours tangled together but never blended in fact they present a continual antithesis and seem to value themselves upon being unlike each other yet each have their own peculiar merits which would entitle them to each other's esteem the french intellect is quick and active it flashes its way into a subject with the rapidity of lightning seizes upon remote conclusions with a sudden bound and its deductions are almost intuitive the english intellect is less rapid but more persevering less sudden but more sure in its deductions the quickness and mobility of the french enable them to find enjoyment in the multiplicity of sensations they speak and act more from immediate impressions than from reflection and meditation they are therefore more social and communicative more fond of society and of places of public resort and amusement an englishman is more reflective in his habits he lives in the world of his own thoughts and seems more self-existent and self-dependent he loves the quiet of his own apartment even when abroad he makes in a manner a little solitude around him by his silence and reserve he moves about shy and solitary and as it were buttoned up body and soul the french are great optimists they seize upon every good as it flies and revel in the passing pleasure the englishman is too apt to neglect the present good in preparing against the possible evil however adversities may lower let the sun shine but for a moment and forth sallies the mercurial frenchman in holiday dress and holiday spirits gay as a butterfly as though his sunshine were perpetual but let the sun beam never so brightly so there be but a cloud in the horizon 
the weary Englishman ventures forth distrustfully with his umbrella in his hand. The Frenchman has a wonderful facility of turning small things to advantage. No one can be gay and luxurious on smaller means. No one requires less expense to be happy. He practices a kind of gibbling in his style of living, and hammers out every guinea into gold leaf. The Englishman, on the contrary, is expensive in his habits, expensive in his enjoyments. He values everything, whether useful or ornamental, by what it costs. He has no satisfaction in show, unless it be solid and complete. Everything goes with him by the square foot. Whatever display he makes, the depth is sure to equal the surface. The Frenchman's habitation, like himself, is open, cheerful, bustling, and noisy. He lives in a part of a great hotel, with wide portal, paved court, a spacious, dirty stone staircase, and a family on every floor. All is clatter and chatter. He is good-humoured and talkative with his servants, sociable with his neighbours, and complacent to all the world. Anybody has access to himself and his apartments. His very bedroom is open to visitors, whatever it be its state of confusion. And all this not from any peculiar hospitable feeling, but from that communicative habit which predominates over his character. The Englishman, on the contrary, ensconces himself in a snug brick mansion, which he is all to himself, locks the front door, puts broken bottles along his walls, and spring guns and man traps in his gardens, shrouds himself with trees and window curtains, exults in his quiet and privacy, and seems disposed to keep out noise, daylight, and company. His house, like himself, has a reserved, inhospitable exterior, yet whoever gains admittance is apt to find a warm heart and a warm fireside within. The French excel in wit, the English in humour. The French have gayer fancy, the English richer imaginations. The former are full of sensibility, easily moved, and prone to sudden and great excitement. But the excitement is not durable. The English are more phlegmatic, not so readily affected, but capable of being aroused to greater enthusiasm. The faults of these opposite temperaments are that the vivacity of the French is apt to sparkle up and be frothy, the gravity of the English to settle down and grow muddy. When the two characters can be fixed in a medium, the French kept from effervescence, and the English from stagnation, both will be found excellent. End of chapter 33 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 34 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter 34 It was about this time, 1840, that Mr. Irving prepared his biography of Goldsmith forming one of the volumes of Harper's Family Library. Footnote. In his preface to Goldsmith, Irving remarks of his writings that they were, quote, the delight of his childhood, and had been a source of enjoyment to him throughout life. End quote. Mrs. Hall pronounces him, quote, one of the most various and pleasing of English writers. End quote. His writings were voluminous, and occupied with a great variety of topics in prose and poetry. Numerous biographies of Goldsmith have appeared at different times, among which those of Irving and Forster and Pryor are perhaps the most valuable. End of footnote. His deeply interesting biography of Margaret Davidson. Footnote. This was the younger of two most remarkable sisters. The elder, Lucretia, Maria, born in 1808, and the younger, Margaret Miller, in 1823. Lucretia began to write verses at four years old, having secretly taught herself writing by copying letters from printed books. At sixteen she was placed at school at Troy, New York, 
for her health was soon undermined by hardy study being unrestrained from severe application she speedily fell into consumption and died at seventeen she destroyed much of her poetry but two hundred and seventy-eight pieces were preserved margaret the younger sister whose biography was prepared by irving was born in eighteen twenty three and was between two and three years old at the death of lucretia she began to write poems at six at ten she wrote and acted a drama her mental activity led her in the same way with her sister and she too died of consumption when about fourteen years and a half old the characters of these two sisters seem nearly angelical while their poems are marked by exceeding sweetness and beauty the works of both sisters are published together of margaret mr irving says quote, i saw her when she was about eleven years old and again when about fourteen she was a beautiful little being as bright and as fragile as a flower and like a flower she has passed away her poetical effusions are surprising and the spirit they breathe is heavenly End quote. End of footnote. his deeply interesting biography of margaret davidson was published in eighteen forty one the copyright of which he transferred to the mother of the youthful poetess in a letter to his sister we have the following vivid and pleasant picture of his country neighborhood as it was at this time and about four years after the completion of sunnyside quote, you would he writes scarcely recognize the place it has undergone such changes these have in a great degree taken place since i have pitched my tent in the neighborhood my residence here has attracted others cottages and country seats have sprung up along the banks of the tappan sea and Terrytown has become the metropolis of quite a fashionable vicinity. When you knew the village, it was a little bit better than a mere hamlet, crouched down at the foot of a hill with its dock for the accommodation of the weekly market shop. Now it has mounted the hill, boasts of its hotels and churches of various denominations, has its little Episcopalian church with an organ, the gates of which on Sundays are thronged with equipages belonging to families resident within ten or a dozen miles along the river banks. We have, in fact, one of the most agreeable neighborhoods I ever resided in. Some of our neighbors are here only for the summer, having their winter establishments in town. Others remain in the country all the year. We have frequent gatherings at each other's houses without parade or expense, and I do not know when I have seen more delightful little parties or more elegant little groups of females we have occasionally excellent music for several of the neighborhood have been well taught have good voices and acquit themselves well both with harp and piano and our parties always end with a dance we have picnic parties also sometimes in some inland valley or piece of wood sometimes on the banks of the hudson where some repair by land others by water you would be delighted with these picturesque assemblages on some wild woodland point jutting into the tappan sea with gay groups on the green under the trees carriages glistening through the woods a yacht with flapping sails and fluttering streamers anchored about half a mile from shore and rowboats plying to and from it filled with lady passengers End of chapter thirty four Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida.